Falchagu Yeo Scott's The Celtic Podcast. Kimra Ha Holodunya, how is everyone? On today's show in Fekimich Beck and Gallic, that's Let's Try Little Gallic. Lesson 23 on the future tense. In Celtic history, it's 11 moments in Irish history. In everyday Celtic ways, the brown man of the moors. Now we're going to hear music from Rachel Walker, Anna Murray, the Selkie Girls, Braybach, and Beyond the Pale. Now it's time for a history of Ireland. Circa 400 AD, Nail Nogaluk, Nail of the Nine Hostages, is placed by medieval texts as legendary Goladuk, High King of Ireland, in the Annals of the Four Masters, and dates his reign as 378 to 405 AD. If you're already a subscriber to the E. Old Scott YouTube channel and enjoy the variety of interesting videos and podcasts that we produce weekly, then you should join us on the E. Old Scott Facebook group. Not only do you get all the great videos you already enjoy, but so much more. Come and connect with your Celtic community here on E. Old Scott Facebook group. Welcome to Learn a Gaelic Song. Today's song is Son of Bruder Maror and it's by Rachel Walker it means I dreamed last night of and this song is about a sailor who begrudgingly leaves his beloved and as depression sinks in he thinks of all the things that separated them he is sad because she was enticed away from him but no matter what she has um He has no bad words for his love. Now, this scenario probably has played out all too many times in the Scottish Isles and along the coast. For C is the work, and relationships often suffer for it. I like to think that true love is strong enough. It pulls home the prospect of reconciliation and rekindled romance. I'm just a romantic. Remember, Gallic's at the top, English at the bottom. Get ready. Look 
Scottish Gaelic is native to the Gales of Scotland. Scottish Gaelic developed out of the Old Irish, and learning this beautiful language can be a direct link to your Gaelic ancestors. Follow along in Fekimich Beckham Gaelic, and like I said, let's try a little Gaelic. Falchagu ye old Scots, the beginner's Gaelic course. Kemraha Huladunya, how is everyone? Looky there, you already know how to say welcome to and how is everyone. All right, in the next 25 lessons um, of Fekim and Speck and Gaelic, that's Let's Try a Little Gaelic, um, with a little work, you can gain a rudimentary understanding of the Scottish Gaelic language. Now, these lessons were taken from my weekly podcast beginning back on May 15th of 2020. So if you like, you can listen to them or there as well. But please remember that I am not an authority on the Gaelic language. I just love learning it. I struggle like most all learners. And so what I teach comes right from well-respected Gaelic teachers. I hope you find it interesting, informative, and fun. And as always, I display on the screen what I'm discussing so you can follow along. All right, Kershmaha, which means, all right then, let's get started. And we're in lesson 23, which is all about future tense of the verb to be. Now, so far, you've seen the present and the past tense of the verb to be. And now we're going to introduce you to the future tense. As you can see, it adheres to the same four types of rules of statements and questions as present and past tenses do. All right, the first one is a positive statement. <clears throat> and we're going to run through the pronouns so you kind of get an idea of how to start off sentences with them. You got the Gaelic and English, of course. You got be me, which is I will be, be you, you will be, be e. I'm sorry, be a, he will be, and be e, she will be, be shin, we will be, be shiv, you will be, plural. Be it, they will be. All right. Now that's just the positive statements, but you can apply that to the other three, which is the negative statement and the positive and a negative question. And you got, of course, you got be me, I will be, which is the positive statement. Kavi me, I won't be, which is the negative statement. Um, be me, I will be, which is the positive question. And not be me, I won't, or won't I be. The negative question. <clears throat> We're going to run through a few examples so you kind of get an idea how they work in a sentence. And of course, we always give the Gaelic and the English. Uh, we will be speaking at the meeting. You will not be going there. Will they be running to the shop? Nach bi i ach iche kus vig. Won't she be eating too much food? All right. And each one of those was in a different one. All right. 
Questions in the future tense use a special form, though, of the future called the relative future. Now, you'll discover even more about the future tense as you advance in your Gallic language, but for now, just remember that you have to use a special form of the future tense with question words. Now, as you'll see on the English side of this first one, uh, Covius, who will be, there's a space, be, space. Now, if it's something like in your, on a person's name, you know, you're identifying it's the definite article, um, say like, uh, let's see, Cov we'll go down here, we use Coviet. Coviet, Avias, how many, um, you know, just, will there be, it's that you don't have to put anything in there, but if you want to put like, um, how many grandchildren will be, will there be, um, Coviet, um, Ua, Avias, okay, that means how many grandchildren will there, will be, okay, <clears throat> so, You'll, you'll see that as we use them in the sentences later on. Let's just run through these real quick. We've got Covius, who will be. J. Avius, what will be. Cunavius, when will be. Carson Avius, why will be. Kimmer Avius, how will be. Coviet Avius, how many will be. And the catcha, of course, always has to be different. Catch and be. Where will be? All right. Like I said, we've got a few examples here so you can see how that works in the sentence. You get the Gallic and the English. Covius a shiasiv fon a skehin show. And who will be standing under this mirror? Catch and be ambu ur. Where will the new store be? Coviet ua avias eravus. How many grandchildren will be on the bus? And be ambu ur ansavala. The new shop will be in the town. All right. Hope that introduces you a little bit to the future tense and hope it didn't confuse you too much. I've got a few sentences here, six as always. You can run through these and use them to, as a little bit of to test your knowledge. So, translate these into English. You got number one, Kavi, Vimi Akeri Anlar. Two, Biu Adol Yan Vanka. Three, Javias U Ajene Flesh Ankora Suit. Um, number four, Ambi Antokras Ors. Five, Kabi Hami Ak Ihya Ak Triurin and six Kacha Ambi Usa Ak Koik Urin.
Celtic history brings you the tales of the land, castles, warriors, heroes, legends, and customs that have created the rich, vibrant, and sometimes strange and wonderful history of the Celtic world. We're going to do the 11 moments that change Ireland's history. Certain moments have had a seismic impact on Irish history, and here are what I see as the most important moments that shaped the Ireland of today. Number one, the coming of the gospel to Ireland. Now through the spread of Christianity, um, is general linked with St. Patrick, it, it had actually been established in Ireland before his arrival in 432. The Irish were in the habit of plundering the long western seaboard of Roman Britain in search of booty. Irish author Neil Hegart explained in his book Story of Ireland, the first Christians in Ireland therefore were most likely Britons carried across the sea as slaves. In 431 AD, not St. Patrick, but Bishop Palladius, an aristocratic Briton who is often left out of the Irish story, arrived from Rome to minister to the Irish believing in Christ. Christianity became fundamental to Ireland's culture and identity, and has played a part in some of the Ireland's greatest struggles, but also it, its glories, like the Book of Kells, for one. Number two, the arrival of King Henry II in Ireland. Now, in 1167, a group of Anglo-Norman adventurers sailed from Pembrokeshire in Wales to County Wexford. Now, within a couple of years, the ports of Waterford, Dublin, and Wexford fell. Though the Irish tried their hardest to put up a good fight, soon after, in 1171, King Henry II arrived in Ireland to add to his extensive empire, making the establishment of the first English colony. The papal possession remained in Ireland for 400 years to come, surviving the Black Death, an indigenous Irish resurgence, and a Scottish invasion. It wasn't until Henry VIII became king in 1541 that England and Ireland became formally united under one crown. All right, number three, the plantation of Ulster. In 1606, Scottish farmers, craftsmen, artisans, and other settlers arrived at the port of Dunedee in County Down and to create the plantation of Ulster, a British Protestant settlement in Northern Ireland, which until this point was the most Catholic part of the country. Some 30,000 colonists then arrived in Ulster, expelling Ga uh, Gallic landowners from their homes. The plantation marked the beginning of a very violent century to come. Oh, wow. Number four, the sack of Drogheda. In August of 1649, uh, English military and political leader Oliver Cromwell marched 30 miles to Drogheda, an Irish port held by royalists, where his troops indiscriminately massacred 3,500 people. This was much of the town's population, Irish, English, Catholic, and Protestant alike. Winston Churchill said the siege cut new gulfs between the nations and the creeds. Upon all of us, there still lies the curse of Cromwell. Yeah. Number five. The Battle of Ulgrim fought in 1691 in the boggy fields of Galway was the final defeat of Catholic Ireland at the beginning of Protestant ascendance. It was the decisive battle of the Williamette War between the Jacobites who are supporters of King James, and the Williamites, supporters of Prince William of Orange. One of Ireland's bloodier battles, and over 7,000 people were killed. All right, number six, an argument on behalf of the Catholics in Ireland. Wolf Tone, one of Ireland's most charismatic national leaders in history, wrote a pamphlet in 1791 titled, An Argument on Behalf of the Catholics in Ireland. 
He dreamt of a non-sectarian Irish Republic, and his compelling pamphlet called for the emancipation of Ireland's Catholics. After it was published, a group of Presbyterian merchants and manufacturers who supported Tone's passion and vision formed the Society of United Irishmen in Belfast. Inspired by the American and French revolutions, they launched the Irish Rebellion of 1798 with the objective of ending British rule over Ireland, which began in May and lasted through September. Now, Tone was captured, tried in court, um in Dublin, and sentenced to be hanged. He took his own life shortly before his execution was to take place, though. Number seven, Daniel O'Connell and the Catholic Emancipation. Uh, Daniel O'Connell envisioned in Ireland where Catholicism and national identity went hand in hand, and he understood the importance of enlisting the masses to achieve goals specifically, repealing the Act of Union, he uh, showed the world the possibilities of mass politics and media and the threat of popular unrest as means of achieving political goals. He had the whole world, not just Ireland and the UK, asking the Irish question of independence. Now, due to O'Connell's mass Catholic association movement, the British government in 1829 were frightened for the first time by the possibility of anarchy in Ireland. Ooh, and Gorda Moore, number eight, The Great Hunger. Probably the most devastating five years in Ireland's history. The Great Hunger began with a potato, a potato blight in 1845 that lasted through 1849, killing over a million with disease and starvation. The population fell into serious decline due to deaths and emigration, and the trauma was felt for years and years after the famine ended. The inaction of the British government exacerbated the famine's effects, and nationalists coined the phrase the Almighty send a potato blight, but the English created the famine. Wow. Nine. Fifteen leaders of the Easter Rising are executed. Wow. Over the course of nine days in May of 1916, the Easter Rising, fifteen leaders of the Easter Rising were executed, uh, were taken from their cells in Dublin's Kilmany Goal to the Stonebreaker's Yard to be executed by firing squad. Of the fifteen, were the seven signatories of the Irish Proclamation, uh, Emin Kent, Thomas James Clark, James Connolly, Sean McDermott, Thomas McDonough, Patrick Pierce, and Joseph Mary Plunkett. The other men executed were Roger Casement, Con Colbert, Edward Daly, Sean Houston, Thomas Kent, John McBride, Michael Mallon, Michael O'Hanoran, and Patrick Pierce's younger brother, William Pierce. Initially, after the Easter Rising, the public wasn't supportive of the rebels because they left Dublin in pieces and many civilians were killed. Now, after British authorities decided to execute the men, they became political heroes. Public opinion shifted radically overnight. Now, this set the scene for the next five years, which brought the end of British rule to Ireland and in 1922 established the Irish Free State. All right. Number 10, Bloody Sunday. Now, even though there had been other Bloody Sundays, this one is the one that really set the tone. And on January 30th, 1972, Civil Rights March for Catholic Equal Rights in Derry, which London Derry, Northern Ireland, took a turn for the horrid when British soldiers opened fire on the crowd of protesters and bystanders. Thirteen men were killed on the spot, seven of whom were teenagers and a 14th died months later due to injuries. While Bloody Sunday doesn't have the highest amount of casualties in Ireland's history of wars and massacres, it was perhaps the most significant event of the Troubles because the fatalities came from the forces of the state itself and in full view of the press and public. Initially, the public accepted the army's claim that the IRA operatives in the crowd fired first. It wasn't until 38 years later that the a new British government inquiry exonerated the victims, deeming the army's actions unjustified ooh, and unjustifiable. And 11, the Good Friday Agreement. Though a solution to the troubles in Northern Ireland for years seemed impossible, the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in April 1998, perhaps the biggest political development in the peace process. Central to the agreement were issues related to civil and cultural rights, decommissioning of weapons, justice, 
and policing, which set a strong framework for uh, Northern Ireland's political progress. It also formed a number of institutions between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, as well as the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom. All right. Well, that's it. Oh,
Everyday Celtic Ways brings you the mythology, traditions, and customs that have created a unique and personal culture that still affects those that are Celtic and those that just love the Celtic world. According to legend, in the moors surrounding the village of Elsden lives the Brown Man of the Moors, a man of dwarven statue dressed in brown with light bright red hair and a ferocious glare. He is said to be a guardian of the moors and protector of the wild beasties who live there, punishing those who hunt or harm them. Just one of many tales of the Brown Man of the Moors comes from a lady named Elizabeth Cockburn of Offton who told a tale to Robert Surtees, who then shared the story with Sir Walter Scott in about 1809. Now, in the year before the Great Rebellion, two young men from Newcastle were sporting on the high moors above Elsdon, and, after pursuing their games for several hours, sat down to dine in a green glen near one of the mountain streams. After their repast, the younger Ian, I'm sorry, the younger lad, ran to the brook of water and after stooping to drink was surprised on lifting his head by the appearance of a brown dwarf who stood on the crag covered with brackens ac across the burn now this extraordinary personage did not appear to be above half the stature of a common man but was uncommonly stout and broad built having the appearance of vast strength now his dress was entirely brown the color of the brackens and his head covered with frizzled red hair. His countenance was expressive and the most savage ferocity, and his eyes glared like a bull. He addressed the young man, first threatening him with his vengeance for having trespassed on his territory, and then asking him if he knew in whose presence which he stood. The young man replied that he supposed him to be the lord of the moors, that he had often... He had offended um, him to just mere ignorance and offered to bring him the game that he had killed. Now, the dwarf remarked that nothing could be more offensive to him than an offer, as he considers wild animals as his subjects and never failed to avenge their destruction. He further informed him that he was, like himself, mortal, though of years far exceeding the lot of common humanity, and that he hoped for salvation. He never he added, fed on anything that had life, but lived in the summer on whortleberries and in the winter on nuts and apples, of which he had great store in the woods. Finally, he invited his new acquaintance to accompany him home and partake in his hospitality, an offer which the young man was about to accept and was just going to spring across the brook when he stopped upon hearing the voice of his companion, who thought he had been gone too long and upon looking around, the wee brown man had vanished. The young man didn't take the encounter with the brown man of the moor seriously, though, and soon after his return, he fell into a lingering disorder and died within a year. Now, this legend has many stories like this associated with it, yet most of us realize that this is just what it is, a story meant for entertainment and warning. However, a short, lonely, middle-aged man in the 1950s named Lester Price, who was obsessed with the brown man, decided to make his obsession real. Upon hearing that he had a terminal disease and had very little time left on this earth, he decided to dress as the brown man of the moors and live out his last days. His disappearance was a mystery for the police, but after a few years was mostly forgotten. That is, until a body was found decades later in the woods dressed like the infamous brown man of the moors, which, of course, set off the fervor of hysteria that he was in fact real and not a legend. Lester would have been happy to know that he kept the legend going, yet about another decade later when DNA started to be used in forensics, his true identity was discovered. But, anyway, Lester got to live out his dream, I guess.
Top 11 Heritage. Now remember to check out my YouTube channel. It's got Celtic music, podcasts, Gallic language, Gallic song, Celtic history videos, plus lots more. And my Facebook group where you can give me your inputs and insights on all things Celtic. Goodbye, Apple Baby. Marcia Weave. Goodbye, But I'm going to let you go with a song. Donald, he jumped up, 
His broadsword he did draw. He struck his wife right through the heart and pinned her against the wall. The grave, the grave, Lord Donald cried to put these lovers in. But bury my lady at the top, for she was of noble kin. 